The vision is revolutionary. Imagine a radical new approach to medical science that utilizes our newfound abilities to manipulate the world of the infinitesimally small, the nano dimension. Imagine tiny sentinels that monitor the minute-by-minute -minute status of our health. Imagine a science that promises radical developments in cell regeneration, our ability to repair lost or damaged tissues. A science that could extend life, revolutionize medical practice. As you can see from the many tools that are out there now, uh, in the systems that are going now into hospitals. This is not a pipe dream, it's reality. A scenario that also approaches science fiction, a vision that, according to some, promotes the emergence of a new human being with enhanced skills and intelligence. But will that promise be fulfilled? And if so, what repercussions will these advances have on our lives? What new questions will we confront? What new issues will we face? We have always counted on new technologies to help us shape our world. Now, researchers are crossing another technological frontier. In the nano dimension, they're learning to manipulate the most intimate mechanics of life. And they promise us more control of our bodies and of our environment. This three-part series explores a mysterious and unknown universe and the revolution it promises. Nanotechnology is already improving our ability to detect the first signs of disease and diagnose genetic predispositions earlier and more efficiently. Conventional tests are time-consuming and expensive. Doctors must depend on complex protocols and sophisticated tools. Many tests must be sent on to large centralized laboratories. To be really fast and efficient, diagnosis would be done on site. Labs and patients would be in the same place at the same time. Dr. Chad Merkin, director of the International Institute for Nanotechnology at Northwestern University. Uh, nanotechnology brings a revolution to medicine in many different areas. Uh, so in the diagnostic front, it's gonna create very accurate, very sensitive tools that enable point of care diagnostics. The point of care being hospitals, the emergency room, and one day, I think, eventually the doctor's office and home. People have talked about this now for a couple of decades. In this case, the nanotech advances are really making it happen. Why such confidence? Because it is precisely at the nanometric scale that the first signs of a disease appear. A human body contains about 100 trillion living cells. In order to coexist together, the cells exchange messages. The messages are tiny molecules, DNA fragments or complex proteins that are only a few nanometers in size. The cascades of reactions set off by these molecular messengers are the language of life, the most intimate form of communication. When a cell is sick, it sends out different messages. Biologists call them biomarkers. They are the molecular signatures of disease and the clues, the indicators, on which the most sophisticated diagnostic instruments depend. It turns out that there is a unique genetic marker and oftentimes a unique protein marker for almost every disease out there, anything living, in fact. And so over the last couple of decades, the world has gotten very good at identifying what these markers are, and now we can begin to create tests for all sorts of different markers that allow us to rapidly assess, determine the state of the disease, and then a course of therapy that follows. This revolution is already underway. The first diagnostic systems based on Chad Merkin's research have already been installed in some American hospitals. The machine embodies many of the advances that nanoscientists promote. It's simple, fully automated, and uses disposable cartridges. 
A single sample allows doctors to detect the presence of different diseases, genetic predispositions, or viruses in the blood. The biggest benefit for doctors is being able to detect multiple different organisms or multiple different targets in the same reaction and to get a decreased turnaround time. The system was to prove its worth in a recent and potentially threatening flu scare. In 2009, we saw um, a recent outbreak of a novel strain of influenza, 2009 H1N1, and through use of nanotechnology, we were able to detect the pathogen, identify it, and determine what type of organism it was, and we were able to do that in a period of about three and a half hours, as opposed to traditional culture methods, which would require that we would grow the organism, and that would then be followed by detecting the organism, and that could take in total of 14 days. For William Moffat, head of Nanosphere, the company which engineered the system, simplicity is a key asset. So the big difference that the uh, nanotechnology uh, enables is us to be able to make this in a unit use disposable format so that all the components and elements necessary to do this test are engineered into the, to the product itself. So an extraordinarily accurate, extraordinarily precise technology that's very simple and low cost to use. But how does this small device replace the work of a whole laboratory? In order to look for biomarkers of diseases, researchers can rely on a fundamental property of molecular messengers. They bind exclusively to certain other molecules according to a lock and key logic. These bonding molecules, called ligands, are receptors which can be used to identify and capture the target should the disease be present. To detect the disease, the researchers need to see whether binding has occurred at a molecular level. To find a solution, Chad Merkin looked back to the days of medieval artisans and their use of gold. Gold nanoparticles are little clusters of gold, actually red in color when they're under 100 nanometers in diameter. Uh, they're very intensely colored, so very dilute solutions appear as highly colored solutions. And actually, for that reason, they were used as uh, stains in stained glass windows back in the Middle Ages. Now, the eternal glitter of gold has a new and more high-tech application. Scientists can stick biological ligands to gold nanoparticles, creating new particles that stand out clearly and are easily detectable. You can think of them as little nano beacons, uh, structures that can latch on to a target molecule that tells me a particular disease marker is present and then gives me a burst of signal. They can differentiate one disease target in the presence of a sea of millions of other disease targets with incredible specificity, in fact, 100% accuracy in most tests. Nano-researchers believe that the appeal of personalized medicine will outweigh the high costs. So it is going to change medicine. It's going to allow clinicians the ability to detect more things, and we're going to be able to develop diagnostics that are fit for individual patients as opposed to those that are developed for the masses. The full impact of this revolution is yet to come. Currently, the system can only perform about 10 different tests. But as new ligands are added, the range of targeted biomarkers can be increased. And these types of tools, as the menu grows and the different capabilities uh, are added to the same uh, uh, basic system, uh, the, the wealth of information one can collect is, is just mind-boggling. You're going to see this ability to detect really low quantities of targets to completely transform the field of medicine because you're effectively taking the blinders off. You're increasing the capabilities of the radar. Other diagnostic devices are coming onto the market, some of them from nano innovations in strikingly different fields. In Italy, Dr. Silvano Dragonieri is trying an unusual approach to disease diagnosis. He's adapting the use of a device originally developed for military purposes to detect traces of explosives or toxic spills, as well as to carry out checks in the food industry, a portable electronic nose. 
we just took it and uh, because it's easily available uh, and uh, not too expensive in order to check whether it could be applied for medicine. Dragonieri's artificial nose has 32 electronic sensors. But in this case, the sensors detect disease, not explosives. As with a dog's recognition of scent, the electronic nose doesn't so much analyze the scent as recognize its pattern and imprint. Paralleling some kinds of pattern recognition software, it detects the big picture rather than separate components. Silvano Dragonieri thinks the nose could detect the first signs of a range of diseases in the breath of a patient. Falls in the control group. It's been uh, found out in the last years that uh, uh, human exhaled breath contains more than 3,000 uh, volatile organic compounds. When you're sick, there's a change in the body's metabolism, a change in chemistry. Subjects, for example, with lung cancer uh, show different uh, volatile organic compounds compared to subjects without it. According to Dragonieri, the nose could be programmed to distinguish between a pathological imprint and a healthy one. Nowadays, the CT scan is the only diagnostic tool used for early detection of lung cancer, but it's expensive and cumbersome. Obtaining a reliable and fast diagnosis simply by blowing into a plastic bag would be both faster and cheaper. The nose is able to distinguish subject with asthma from subject without it, subject with lung cancer from subject without it, and from subject with the chronic bronchitis. Research is being carried out in laboratories around the world, and some scientists suggest that this type of diagnostic device could be in use within the next decade. Should the promise be fulfilled, these advances in early detection will make diagnosis more immediate and less intrusive. I came here for the first time in 2040. I'd just met this girl, Lisa and she dreamt about visiting the city of the future, as the media called it. I had plenty of time, and she was good-looking, so why not? Nano city or not, it seemed that some things would never change. Customs, immigration and public health services. Well, here they were called customs, immigration and public health. A simple formality. Lonely and they were very polite. This way, please. Perhaps too polite. Come on, darling. Thanks. Well, first, sir, would like to They led us into separate rooms, but I soon felt this was not going to be the usual interview. Sorry to interrupt your journey, but we're working with the public health... This was a public health investigation, and they had good news we for me. good news. I didn't carry any Class A virus. Demic control test, which means that you are not a Class... But they had noticed that neither Lisa nor I were wearing so any check you know what patch. A check patch is? A uh, check patch. A nano patch. A check patch, as you can see on my colleague's wrist. In fact... Check Patch was a new real-time diagnostic device, and they were offering to lend me one for the rest of my stay here. I would benefit from high-tech medical protection while in the city, and at the same time, wouldn't pose a potential health threat to the locals. We perfectly understand. The very idea of this invasion of my privacy was unacceptable, and their attitude had started to get on my nerves. I began wondering whether this wasn't some marketing stunt initiated by Check Patch. Or do I need to call my lawyer? Don't put other people's health in danger. I let them know I'd had enough of it. Okay, okay, okay. Save your breath. My answer is no. But apparently their Check Patch was not compulsory. I'd like to go. Very well, sir. As you wish. You're free to go. But first, if you please, could you sign this, please? Still, they didn't let me go without signing an official disclaimer. Thank you, sir. Goodbye. Goodbye. And enjoy your stay. It's a bloody circus here. 
Lisa was already in the hall. You okay? Yes. And she had some news of her own. That's not a reason. She was wearing a check patch. What do you mean, no reason to get mad? Stupidly, I lost my temper. Rather good. Doesn't Said a few things I wished I hadn't. You did. I called her naive, gullible. You'd buy anything, wouldn't you? Calm down. What? Next thing I knew, I was in hospital. Hello, Mr. Santos. You fainted at the airport. I'd fainted at the airport, and when I came around, I was in for a but shock. I noticed you don't take much care of your body. The doctors knew everything about me. Not all of it was good. And your sugar level is 16% above average. Especially the news he saved for the end. Lung cancer. What are my chances? Chances of what? My chances of survival. What do you mean? There's nothing serious in all of this. But he seemed to me a little casual about it. Was this some yes, kind of joke? A very small cancer at a very early stage. Apparently not. Nothing to in Nano City, cancer was simply not a problem anymore. If it was detected early enough, it could be easily cured. I was stunned. There might be a small problem, though. But not as much as when I realized that not having the right insurance, they were planning to send me back home. Are you telling me you're going to send me back to my country to die slowly from a cancer that you could easily treat here? Yes, no, I'm not the one that makes the laws. Listen, I'm And that wasn't all. This guy had casually told Lisa I had cancer, and she had panicked. Because thanks to her new patch, he had just told her that she was pregnant. What? She obviously did Three days pregnant. I never saw Lisa again. In parts of the world, life expectancy is on the increase, but there are still diseases that confound. Philip Kantoff is a cancer specialist at the Dana-Farber Institute in Boston. Right now, cancer remains one of the leading causes of death in the United States and around the world. People are living longer, but still, it's a challenge to cure people with advanced disease. After numerous preclinical trials, Kantoff is testing a protocol that is radical and highly selective and is being used for the first time on cancer patients. The traditional approach to treating cancer has been with chemotherapy, which are chemicals that are relatively nonspecific in that they kill cancer cells, but they kill normal cells as well. And as a result of that, they cause toxicity or side effects. This was also the challenge facing Omid Farakzad from Harvard Medical School and Professor Robert Langer from MIT. How to design a treatment that would target only rogue cells and spare the healthy ones. If you take the chemotherapy drug docetaxel and if you give that drug in its conventional form, you know, something in the neighborhood of maybe a couple of percent of the drug actually ends up going to the tumor. And, the, and, you know, a huge portion of that administered dose actually goes to other places where it's cause of toxicity. With targeted delivery, you control exactly where you want your drug molecule to go. Dr. Farakzad and his team are encouraged by the results of the early trials. What we are seeing across a range of animal models of cancer is that we are always able to improve the efficacy of a drug compared to the parent drug. And we are almost always able to improve the safety of that in animal models. Given such precise targeting, the team has been able to increase the dosage of the drug without causing any apparent adverse side effects. Only the tumor takes the hit. In the context of a nanoparticle, you can increase the amount of drug at the tumor site by 20-fold. Now, in order to achieve that level of tumor concentration of a chemotherapy drug, you would have to give a very high dose of chemotherapy, which would actually be lethal to a patient. But in the context of a targeted nanoparticle, you get essentially complete tumor eradication. The particles are only tens of nanometers in size but their sophisticated engineering gives them some unique properties. 
They're so small that they can roam the body freely as they hunt for the diseased cells. They also contain an anti-cancer drug. The first phase of this structure was resolved some 30 years ago when scientists succeeded in containing the active drug molecule in a plastic nanoparticle. By altering or amending the formula, scientists can also control the size and porosity of the particle and the quantity of the dose. Although the particles can travel the body, they must also outwit that bastion of human health, the immune system. But how? Professor Langer staged an elaborate trick. He attached tiny filaments capable of capturing water molecules to the particles. The camouflaged particle is then able to circulate in the bloodstream for several hours without being detected before finally dissolving. Omid Farakzad took the initiative a step further and added a homing device, ligands that bind to specific receptors that grow only on the membrane of tumor cells. Now the nanoscale drug delivery system can specifically recognize one cell from the other and deliver its payload to the desired cell and to a far lesser degree to a cell that it's not supposed to go to. And once their task is accomplished, the particles are designed to be eliminated naturally. The material that we use in the context of uh, designing our nanoparticles have actually been used in in other medical systems for well over four decades. And these nanoparticles tend to degrade in the body into essentially lactic acid and glycolic acid. And these are molecules that the body uses actually to create energy. The production unit that's building the nanoparticles needed for the clinical tests fits in a single room. It can be run by a team of only three people. There are 10 to the 15 nanoparticles in this vial. We've manufactured these uh, thousands of vials for, for clinical studies in the course of a few days. No special security is required for a facility such as this. Simply just controls to assure that we're making uh, reproducibly a safe and sterile product uh, for the treatment of patients. The targeted delivery protocol is the first in the world to enter human clinical trials. So far, the team tells us, there are no signs of toxicity related to their technology. But it's been less than a year since the test began. I think it's very important not to overhype this um, and, and to say that this is a stepwise uh, approach. The animal results are very, very promising. Um, you know, the, what remains to be seen is whether that can be achieved in humans, and it's a, it, is, it is a leap from going from animals to people. Um, so we're, we're hopeful, but we're cautiously optimistic. It is a formidable jump. However, Omid Farakzad believes the basic principles of targeted delivery could revolutionize contemporary medicine and lead to a reappraisal of many other therapies. The real potential of nanotechnology goes far beyond cancer therapy. You can develop far more effective treatments for cardiovascular disease. Um, you can develop much more efficacious vaccines. A few kilometers away, a sister company is hoping to develop nano vaccines. The approach is based on the same principles. Nanoparticles target the cells of the immune system by imitating the shape, size, and molecular signature of natural pathogens. We understand much better the immune system. And what we do is apply the nanotechnology to make mimic synthetic vaccines that are much more potent 
and that can address different diseases. Well, we've worked in a broad range of diseases with this platform, and these have included infectious diseases like viral diseases, where we uh, have some interesting results in universal flu vaccinations. We've also had some good preliminary results in therapeutic vaccines, uh, both for the applications in cancer and in a different uh, application in autoimmune disease. Early trials confirm that targeted particles can artificially stimulate an organism's natural defenses by teaching it how to respond when a disease attacks. Nanotechnology brings an absolute revolution into the vaccine world. We would not be able to obtain these large immune responses in these different disease areas with this safety, without actually the nanotechnology. We not only have more directed immune response, it actually, in our animal studies, have shown to be safer than conventional types of approaches because we only deliver the active agents to the cells that need them. The first synthetic nanovaccines are about to begin clinical trials and could be available in five to six years. As with other nanotechnologies, the company's minimalist approach could lead to cheaper costs. And that little vessel right there, uh, that holds about 10 to 20,000 vaccine doses. And we can do that and make full commercial scale for worldwide production, maybe in a room that's, you know, 10 meters by five meters in size, roughly. This particular method is very safe. In doing that, it's small, it's contained, uh, it's easily done, uh, and it's using uh, what we call unit operations or uh, technologies that already exist in the pharmaceutical industry and have been out there. Nanoparticle cancer drugs and nano vaccines are just two of the early applications of targeted delivery, but they open up other possibilities. I do believe that the nanotechnology and the concept that we are developing should make it able to actually attack most of the diseases that currently have not been able to, to receive treatment. Um, the future will show we will have to do a lot of work to demonstrate that, but the potential of this is clearly there. What we are seeing today is just really a tip of the iceberg. What's underneath is just humongous, almost difficult to imagine today. But what I do know is that the medicine that we're going to be practicing 30, 40, 50 years from now will look nothing like today. Medical futurists foresee the widespread use of cocktails of targeted nanoparticles patrolling the body, programmed to identify and combat disease, a brave new world which promises perfect health and longer lives. I'd applied for a humanitarian visa, and they'd cured my cancer all right and the rest of me too. I hadn't realized what poor shape I was in until I came here. Hadn't cared much, I guess. But now I knew, and I decided to stay. It seemed the safe thing to do. And I liked the look of the place. But by then, I'd found another reason to stay. Rachel. I didn't understand at first what it was she had that got to me. She was beautiful, all right, but she was more than that. I'd never met anyone like her. She had a depth of feeling, a very gentle and strong outlook on life. She took time to enjoy every minute of it. She never seemed to work or have much of a social life, but she kept a distance towards me, like she was cautiously protecting herself from me. In fact, I didn't know anything about her. Then one day, she'd asked me to come to her home. And that's where I found she had a husband, George. When she'd married him, George was a famous research scientist. They'd been happy together for 30 years, until he was in an accident and lost both his legs. He gave up his career and became a virtual recluse. 
For more than 20 years now, George had been addicted to a very powerful nano-targeted drug. Straight to the brain, no secondary effects. Day after day, he would sit on the terrace and look at the sea. It was his choice, and she respected it. It was a heartbreaker, but yet something sounded wrong about this story. George was too young. You don't understand, do you? George was pursuing a wonderful dream to free humanity from disease and suffering. Out of love, I tested with him the new molecular correction treatment he had just invented. Thank you. It went well at first, and then George started to change. He began to take more and more risks, as if he wanted to test the boundaries of his new condition. Until his accident. Today I'm 89, and he is 92. And nobody knows how long we are going to live. We didn't have a child, and I lost all the people I loved. You will probably disappear long before me. It was a mistake to think that the end of disease would be the end of suffering. A journey without end. Living a youthful life at 92 might become an option for some, but the immediate, more prosaic reality lies in maintaining our metabolism. Most of our body tissues stop developing when we reach adulthood. If damaged by accident or disease, can they be restored? In Chicago, scientists at the Institute for Bio-Nanotechnology and Medicine are at work on a radically new approach. Samuel Stoop, the center's director, is employing what he calls molecular signals to help encourage cells to continue growing and to help regenerate lost or damaged tissue. When our bodies are forming, there are many signals that are taking place where cells are being instructed by uh, nanostructures, in fact, outside of the cell to produce certain tissues, to also produce the signals that allow cells to connect with each other and form an organ to form a functional tissue. The idea in nanotechnology is to create nanostructures that are synthetic and they are built and designed to talk to cells as though they were uh, parts of the natural tissue during development. Sam Stoop has designed nanoparticles which self-assemble into nanometric filaments. Those filaments gather up in coils much like collagen, the natural structure that guides the growth of cells to form most of our body's tissues. Ramil Shaw, head of one of the laboratories at the Institute, has studied the behavior of cells when implanted in new and artificial structures. Our natural tissues are made up of collagen fibers, and these fibers are nanofiber structures. A cell can actually um, see a nanofiber, and if it's surrounded by a bunch of nanofibers, it can interact with each individual nanofiber. Usually, cells are signaled in the body through proteins that tell the cell to attach, to migrate, to multiply a number. If we can take those signals that the body naturally gives the cells and put them into these artificial matrices, then we can use that to instruct the cells to do what we wanted them to do. Sam Stoop has modified the particles so that the surface of the filaments is covered with proteins that instruct cells to grow tissues. 
and the results have been spectacular. It's really neat to see cells really responding to a material because if it's highly bioactive, they thrive, they're very vibrant and alive. And so when you see that, you know, researchers get excited, you know, especially if it's a new material because you know that this has promise. An artificial environment which encourages cells to form specific tissues in vitro is already a great success. But Sam Stoop is looking further ahead. Regenerative medicine technology has to be something that the patient can receive in a doctor's office or in a hospital. It has to be easy to do. So we thought we could create those molecules, put them in a solution, and then just inject them. Inject them in the human body, place them wherever they're needed so that they can promote regeneration. Ramil Shah and her husband Nirav, an orthopedic surgeon, have designed an experiment that regenerates cartilage in rabbits. It is extremely simple. You have a site where cartilage needs to grow again, and at that site, you place uh, the liquid that contains these molecules, and these molecules right at that site build these filaments into some kind of network, and that network is ready to interact with cells. Even sophisticated surgery techniques necessarily produce scar tissue, but experiments with nanoparticle gel enable almost perfect regeneration. The results from the rabbit model were very exciting very promising because we showed that not only did it help regenerate tissue, the cartilage tissue within the defect, but it also preserved the quality of cartilage in the surrounding uh, surface. If we can prove that uh, the results are also very good in larger animal, animal models and that it's also safe, um, then we'll move on to human clinical trials. And so that's sort of down the road, but um, yeah, research is continuing. There have been further tests to explore the regeneration of other body parts, blood vessels, skin, bone, and tooth enamel. So far, tests have been positive. What we envision is actually a very broad platform of nanostructures that are chemically designed to signal cells and that can be customized for specific targets in regenerative medicine. Stoop and his colleagues are also attempting to regenerate neurons. In one trial, a paralyzed mouse was able to regain use of its back paws. It's an ambitious project. The rehabilitation of the cells that power the brain and nervous system offers extraordinary promise in the treatment of a range of trauma and disease. It would be great to regenerate new neurons in, for Alzheimer's patients also or to, to have different ways of dealing with brain injuries. Again, you have to produce new neurons, or uh, if not produce new neurons, at least you need to uh, promote branching of neurons that are already there, and I guess have been damaged either by trauma or by some disease. To achieve this, the nanoparticles have been customized to self-assemble and to form artificial cells that carry molecular messengers similar to the ones that support the neuron's growth in the brain. And the neurons flourish in this artificial environment. Their extensions grow and spread to make new connections. It's an approach that could have many other applications, but there are still challenges ahead. Some targets are going to be more difficult than others. Um, it, I think cartilage, for example, will happen relatively quickly, or bone. Uh, I think uh, other targets like the brain and, and even the heart uh, might take a little bit more time. But in our bodies, all of the major processes involving cells occur through signaling. And, and the objects that are involved in those signals are, from the standpoint of the nanotechnologists, 
they are nanostructures. So in a way, it gives you the idea that uh, we can manipulate the human body in ways that we never thought about before. I'm a photographer, and Rachel had given me the idea to shoot the portraits of the modified, the forerunners of a new humanity. And this work had caught the attention of the famous Salvatore, owner of a very influential art gallery, famous for its ability to shock. Lovely to meet you. Rachel told me a lot. He wanted to see the whole series, to maybe stage an exhibition. And I can't wait to see the rest of it. Rachel, who you know, she's 92 years old today. This is Jim, ex-cripple. He's with the Special Forces now. Multiple reconstructions and an amplified sensorial system. A dangerous animal. Bill, hyper muscle and bone growth. Suffered from cardiac malformation at birth. His father trained him. He won six medals at the last Olympic Games. The case is currently being studied by the committee. Eleanor, the one, she's everywhere. Entirely redesigned after a plane crash. Equipped with a lot of extras. She's a puppet. Very touching. And this is David. He loved the pictures, he loved the concept. And the timing for him was perfect. Enhancement and post-humans was a burning project. Brilliant idea, and they're all great. He said he would have to devise a special approach that would appeal to his clientele. The essence of this post-humanism. We're going to aim big. I didn't quite understand what he meant, but it sounded like good news, so I decided to trust him. Hello, dear. How are you? On opening day, it became obvious that I shouldn't have. When I arrived, there was already a little crowd, but something was wrong. People behave strangely, and I didn't see a single picture of mine. Oh, That's when a yeah, cheerful I Salvatore see. suddenly appeared. I love it. I told you. He sounded enthusiastic. I, I just got more perplexed. Where are my photos? And it must have been showing, because he started apologizing. Don't tell me you didn't get the chip. He was so sure he had sent me the chip with the invitation. He was right. There it was. But I still didn't know what to do with it. Tell me. You're then queer. he began to look very embarrassed. Oh my God! I, I'm so sorry. He had presumed that, like all his customers, I had an implanted reader. It was so cool and fashionable. Stay there. I should. He said something about an old device he kept for the workers and vanished again. It was like a nightmare. Everybody seemed to stare at me like I was a strange animal. I'm sorry, it's really not very practical. But then he came back with a huge pair of glasses. I have an upper-class clientele, and uh, we're all equipped, you know. Putting them on was quite an experience. Now, I did see, and hear too. It was fascinating. Hey, voila. So. But I soon felt dizzy. They were the real post-humans. Their world had not much in common with mine anymore. And then I thought, maybe that's what getting old is about. But does the enhanced human, half man, half machine, have much of a future other than in the movies and science fiction? An influential American study, Converging Technologies for Improving Human Performance, suggests that it might. 
Nanofuturists also point towards recent advances that suggest that science is coming closer to connecting our nervous system to electronic devices, like smart hand. Index finger. Come back. Smart hand is a robotized hand designed to give increased mobility to amputees. Not only can the recipient directly control movement, as with a normal limb, but thanks to sensors inserted into the fingers, the robotized hand is able to send back a feeling of pressure to the brain. I have to use some muscles which I haven't activated for years, and that's very hard. But if you're able to control a movement, it's great. I have a feeling that I haven't had for a long time. Now I'm getting sensation back. When I grab something tightly, then I can feel it in my fingertips, which is strange since I don't have them anymore. It's fantastic. Smart hand is an extraordinary achievement, but it's still the brain that is doing the work. Small devices placed on the skin of the patient's arm stump relay the pressure recorded by the sensors in the hand. The patient's brain then assimilates the message, a phenomenon that amputees often experience and Professor Lundborg has long studied, the phenomenon of the phantom limb. With this principle, by stimulating the phantom hand map, you can uh, really give an illusion of uh, a true sensation. You don't have to interfere with the brain or the spinal cord or the peripheral nerves. Perhaps you can one day um, get the artificial sensibility from a hand prosthesis directly into the right parts of the brain to have the perception of uh, tactile stimuli in the hand. There are a lot of research going on in this area, but it's more of a science fiction thing uh, today. Building connections between brain and machine continues to fascinate, and nanotechnology will likely play a significant role. But to many researchers, there are more immediate and rewarding challenges. Enhancements. <laughs> That's sort of not the goal of, of this research, or my research. <laughs> just, uh, we just want to improve patient quality of life. It's really to, um, to bring back what it used to be, the perfect tissue. Not, I don't know what would be better than having a perfect tissue, actually. <laughs> Advocates believe the science balances a new understanding of the nano dimension with discoveries in other disciplines. It's especially relevant, they say, as the scale reflects the most fundamental processes of life. As science has progressed, we have learned about all the processes that uh, keep us alive, and uh, we know it in a level of detail that makes it possible now for scientists that work in chemistry and in physics and in engineering disciplines to emulate those processes with synthetic structures. The nano revolution promises less invasive, more preventive, personalized medicine. But right now, it's a revolution that is little known beyond the lab and big business, and its future is difficult to predict. People contemplated this magic bullet or targeted delivery almost over 100 years ago, but you know, with, with, with nanotechnology, we are beginning to realize that in a very significant and substantial way today. In the next, say, five or 10 or 15 years, what we're gonna see is much better systems uh, uh, in, the, in the context of drugs and imaging and diagnostics than we have today. The longer term sequelae of this impact, I would actually would be curious to see myself what happens in 40 or 50 years from now. The spread of these approaches could be very fast and could be all the more pervasive because of their apparent simplicity. And I think the thing that probably struck me the most about nanoparticle technology in a product is uh, we can make a two-year supply of nanoparticles in a coffee cup. 
So it's a much smaller scale operation. It's almost as if the manufacturing operation itself comes down to the scale of the underlying technology. These are technologies that are not based upon uh, uh, expensive components. In fact, it's the know-how to build them that's important. As that type of technology matures, as we get more and more advances, the competition will begin to drive the prices down, and you'll see then an explosion in terms of the dispersion of these types of technologies all over the world. Nanoscience has caught the imagination of many in the medical community, matched only by the enthusiasm of investors. Such backing comes at a price. Much of the new research is patented. As a science, it promises much. But is there a will to share its wonders, its promise of universal and low-cost access? That would be a true revolution.